Councillor Ben Johnson. I, uh, I didn't prepare a full speech tonight or anything. I, I was quite keen to hear what people had to say about these motions. Uh, I, I'm also keen not to repeat too much of what's already been said. Um, but I, I, I will talk briefly about my experience of the night in question, which was a, a relatively peaceful one. I was, uh, I was at home in Tooting and uh, saw everything that was going on TV, saw what was going on in uh, Clapham Junction and obviously was horrified and heard at the same time through all the usual social networks that people plug into these days that uh, uh, Tooting Police Station was on fire, that people were attacking shops all over Tooting Broadway and so on. And, uh, didn't believe any of this to be true as it happened because I couldn't see or hear anything going on in the immediate vicinity outside. Went for a walk down the high street and, and it's true, the worst that was happening was uh, a few small groups of uh, hoodie clad people on the streets, perhaps looking for a spark to ignite, which fortunately, uh, fortunately for the residents of Tooting never came. But nevertheless, there was still clearly a sense of uh, great uh, unease, of great uh, uh, fear on the streets that night, even a good few miles away from uh, Clapham Junction and other areas where uh, we saw um, the riots. And that brings me on to uh, part of the real concern here that, um, you know, it, people have said already that the police, you know, were incredibly brave that night. We saw a lot of courage. We can't... Um, we can't really blame the Metropolitan Police for the deployment decisions it took, perhaps uh, unfortunate as they turned out to be in the case of Clapham Junction. Uh, police did a great job where they were deployed, um, and obviously the safety of officers has to come as a priority in any decisions about deployment immediately on the night. Um, but nevertheless, numbers locally were overwhelmed, um, and people were frightened, people felt scared people felt let down people felt that uh, no one was there to protect them and it, it, it it's often said it's a uh, long been said that the first duty of the state is the protection of the realm and i wonder if perhaps a modern interpretation of that might be that the first duty of the state is in fact keeping our streets peaceful and safe um, on this occasion that didn't happen the uh, the state failed to do that um, this brings me on to uh, police numbers. We've, you, you know, we, we've, we've heard a lot about police, and in particular I'd like to comment on SNTs. Um, a couple of people have questioned whether SNTs would have made any difference that night, what the relevance of that is to this situation. And I was just thinking before, you know, to, the SNTs aren't about a response. Councillor Gibbons touched on this. Uh, they contribute to an ongoing sense of... Um, sense of uh, safety. They help create a safer environment. I, I like to think that they help to keep cri crime down, not because of their response, but because they exist in the first place, because they create a, an environment and perhaps a perception in which criminality is less likely. And I think that's why it's important that this side has brought that part of the debate here tonight. Um, I want to deal with a few of the claims that have been made. Um, we've heard a few uh, facts and figures bandied about. I mean, first of all, in terms of London, uh, London's already seen a reduction uh, of 900 officers from, that's the figure from earlier this year, from March this year, the most recent I could find. On the previous March, uh, Her, Maj Her Majesty's Inspectorate of the Constabulary are saying there'll be 1,900 fewer over the course of uh, the next few years, over the course of the spending review. Um, Councillor Cook, I think, mentioned that uh, decided to uh, bring um, what the Labour government might have done uh, with police numbers into it. And I believe that, again, this is going on what HMIC have said, the 12% plan for deficit reduction over the course of a parliament would have, in fact, have allowed uh, police nationwide to maintain frontline officer numbers without any cuts. That's not me saying that. That's an independent body. Um, I believe that Mac Councillor Macdonnell mentioned something about waste and this is a party which uh, wants to spend up to £100 million on unelected police commissioners which could instead fund about 600 full-time police officers. Um, I think uh, Councillor Maxwell Scott said something about, um, about outputs and when Labour left office in uh, 2010 I think we had uh, 
16,000 more police officers on the streets. By the end of this parliament, we'll have 16,000 fewer. Uh, we saw a drop in crime of 38% uh, on 1997, and now just the annual figures in July showed, a four, showed that uh, burglary is up 14%, violent crime is up 38% rise in assault with minor injuries. So, you know, these figures count. There are outcomes as well as uh, inputs. Um, I'm going to close there. As I said, I uh, didn't prepare a speech. I simply wanted to hear what was said. Um, so, uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. <laughs> Councillor Cousins. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, if members would just indulge me very briefly, in the outbreak of negotiations over motions today, one of the things that was lost in it was uh, a reference to some of the work that had gone on um, afterwards. And I, I would just like to pay tribute, uh, having been privileged to spend the best part of two, work, uh, two weeks working very closely, particularly in Lavender Hill in my own world with the town centre manager, uh, TCIS manager and the business rate service, who have done an excellent job in helping businesses uh, get back on their feet remarkably quickly. Um, anyone, uh, as I know, Councillor Belton was actually on Lavender Hill enjoying uh, Donna Margarita will know uh, that the business has rebounded remarkably quickly and the customers uh, responded to that remarkably well. Hogg, oh, I apologise to Councillor Hogg for, for missing him. Um, just moving on, we've, we've spoken a little bit uh, about the rioters uh, and the motivations behind this. Um, it's almost been tangential to the whole discussion. We start off um, with some of the facts and figures about the rioters and their profile, the fact that actually most of them were adults, so one would assume possibly not too bothered uh, about EMA reductions uh, or youth service provision that may or may not have been available on the 8th of August. Um, and then we talk about what the motivations may have been. Was it greed? Uh, was it someone trying to get back their taxes, which I suspect they hadn't paid a huge amount of, uh, as they suggested on YouTube? Well, perhaps. Uh, was it revenge? Uh, and we've heard many people, uh, and I've heard a lot of anecdotal evidence that actually some people felt that the police almost had it coming to them. Maybe that was a bit of it. Did all the people on the 8th of August and uh, on the 6th and the 7th elsewhere in London sit down, exchange messages uh, on the Blackberry Messenger service and say, you know what, this SNT reorganisation, it's a bit of a shocker, isn't it? I think, I think we need to get down to Foot Locker and show what we think about this. Of course, it wasn't. Um, but SNT, uh, SNTs do have a role to play. Actually, Councillor Gibbons, uh, I think I, I'll be honest here, I think one of the finest contributions I've heard him make in this chamber touched on the nub of this. SNTs have a role. They play a role in reassurance. They play a role in community liaison. They play a role uh, in being that individual, that individual set, uh, group of individual officers that residents know, that residents can talk to, that residents can raise local issues with. But the fact is, those local issues are local. They are different. The local issues in Queenstown that Councillor Cooper met earlier are not going to be the same as the local issues in East Putney, the second safest ward, as Councillor MacDonald, uh, Councillor MacDonald mentioned, and therefore, nor should the response be the same. It is simply uh, a poor use of resources to suggest that we have an equal SNT team in every single ward, and we should maintain those numbers uh, to keep that response equal. Frankly, the problems in Queenstown, and I know a little bit about them, uh, deserve a lot more attention than the problems in, in East Putney. And I don't think we should be ashamed to say that and explain to the residents of both Queenstown and of East Putney, this is why resources are allocated differently. We resource intelligently. And then we talk about the use of resources when it comes to things like public order training uh, and the use of response uh, police on the streets. One of the problems that we do have is that if uh, an officer is walking down the street, spots a crime in progress, perhaps uh, a mugging, uh, sees some shoplifting and makes an arrest, that will take them out for the rest of their shift. It isn't an intelligent use of resources to have fully trained officers behind desks filling in paperwork. They should be out preventing crime, reassuring the public. Likewise, when it comes to, well, let's just increase the number of public order trained police, this is an ongoing process. It requires a higher level of fitness, it requires a higher level of training than the ordinary uh, constable. It will take them off the street. It will mean there are less police on the streets having reassurance, uh, providing that reassurance. And it's always been the Met position to have a small number of very, very highly trained public order officers rather than having all the officers public order trained because, frankly, policing by consent doesn't use a riot shield. And Matthew, uh, Councillor Maxwell-Scott, I think, 
touched on the matter uh, and really got to the heart of the matter that this is boiled down to a simplistic argument. The simplistic argument is, well, something went wrong, therefore, what can we do? Well, we need more police. Actually, we don't necessarily need more police. We need to look at the police we've got. We need to make sure that we're using them intelligently. We need to look at their strategic role, how they're uh, allocating their resources, what they're seeking to achieve over a period of time. We need to look at how they deploy themselves tactically, whether they're doing the right thing at the right time in response to things like the Tottenham riots uh, and the subsequent riots that uh, copycat, uh, uh, copycat riots that occurred over London. And we need to look at how they are deployed operationally, uh, how they're trained, the roles that they play, whether it's SNT in response, and how they're tasked on a daily basis to ensure that they are fulfilling the strategic and tactical uh, uh, ob objectives. I think just in conclusion, uh, Madam Mayor, what we have in, in these motions is a very, very simple choice. We have a choice presented with the minority party's op um, uh, amendment. We throw money at it. We increase the number of SNTs. We increase the number of police with public order trains, uh, training, the number of police with riot shields, regardless of whether that's necessary or not. Or we have an option that I think I would prefer, that we have an intelligent response. We take the time. We learn the lessons that are there to be learnt, and we apply them and we continue keeping Wandsworth as in a London safe as poor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cousins. Councillor Osborne. Following the events in this borough, uh, particularly damaging in this borough compared with many of the others, uh, and some of the things that happened uniquely in this borough, this council has a number of duties. First duty is to meet second to discuss what happened and thirdly we believe uh, and I think it's there's a consensus on this uh, across the council chamber uh, to make a statement about police numbers and this is the reason why we don't fully understand exactly what happened in the period of the riots there have been late night television shows with people debating it there are inquiries it'll take some time before we fully grasp what happened uh, over those few days we're left with anecdotal uh, evidence and we're left with our own experiences. One particular conversation especially haunting for me uh, with a businessman in Tooting talking actually about the period before 8th of August uh, when he spent uh, a considerable amount of time uh, with the assistance of our town centre manager in Tooting trying to find out what was going on trying to allay fears where appropriate, trying to protect his business, uh, and trying to protect Tooting. Uh, and he's very articulate about just how scared everybody was. Uh, and rightly so, because there was something unleashed in that period which we don't yet fully understand. Um, scared not just the shopkeepers, but the local citizens, his <coughs> customers, who uh, desperately hurried to get home. Uh, and lock themselves in because they were scared of what might be going on on their streets. It has been suggested, uh, tentatively I, I, I think if I'm honest, uh, that this all starts with a, uh, a protest about the tragic shooting of Mark Duggan. Um, actually, if you look closely at it all, it's very difficult to see how any protest can be supported by hefting a flat screen TV out of an electric uh, shop. Um, there's been some suggestion that they're part of the cause of all this was alienated young people. Well, I'm sorry, the age profile just doesn't really support that, the age profile of those engaged. There's been a suggestion that this all is all anchored on social deprivation in some way. Well, what's been reported includes transit vans parked in suburban streets being repeatedly loaded with stolen goods by people who clearly knew how to get rid of those stolen goods once they'd acquired them. Um, doesn't sound like the socially deprived to me. It sounds like people who the evidence suggests were actually quite well healed. And quite well healed thanks to the profits they're making in criminal activity. And it looks as though, perhaps not a majority even, but somewhere at the core of what happened, there is some group of people, feral, disengaged, not properly connected with society, who take what they want, when they want, from whoever they want, except there's a slight twist. They will rob from the rich if they can, but they don't do that very often. 
they will usually rob from the poor because they're more vulnerable and easier targets. They will attack the strong when they get a chance, but actually they don't do that very often. They will most often attack the weak because they are feral and disengaged from society. Perhaps we are to blame at some level. Perhaps we've ignored them. Perhaps we have not addressed that problem and perhaps we need to start doing that. But we need to be clear that these people are a tiny minority of the people out there, the people of our society, and they're attacking the vast majority of us. I've no doubt that actually there is genuine political, social dissatisfaction out there. And perhaps we should be addressing it. Perhaps we should be doing something about it. Those people need meaningful social justice, maybe. I've no doubt that there is unnecessary social deprivation out there as well. We should be addressing that too. We should be assisting people. I've no doubt there's alienation out there. But do you know what? When your streets, your homes and your livelihoods are under attack, you do not pick up the phone and say, help, please give assistance to the socially deprived. You don't pick up the phone and say, let's deal with the alienated youth. You pick up the phone and you say, help, police. And what happened in Wandsworth was, on the night when we needed the police, the police didn't say, sorry, we can't come right now, we're coming later. The police said, we're not going to come at all. And that is what happened uniquely, as far as we can tell, in Wandsworth on the night of the riots. What happens if the police don't come at all? First of all, someone somewhere must have taken the decision. Well, we know that decision was taken. Three things about that decision. That decision to hold back and not intervene. First of all, as somebody has suggested earlier, don't mean to repeat the point, but I think it's worth it. Field Marshal Hindsight always gets the strategy and tactics right. He is a strategic and tactical genius. But somebody on the spot, I thank goodness it wasn't me, and I guess you all do the same, doesn't quite have the information at their disposal. Second point, doesn't matter how you cut it. If the police are saying they're not going to come, doesn't matter what perspective you take, it must mean there simply aren't enough police. I have one good thing to say about what happened that night on that decision. At least there was somebody somewhere to take a decision. Let me tell you this. If somebody hadn't taken that decision, deplore it or condone it, if somebody hadn't taken that decision, then the emergency authorities would have been left floundering and the consequences would have been even more dire than what actually happened. Somebody somewhere took a decision and that moved us an inch or two forward. And we should thank goodness for that. The police aren't going to come. What does that mean? The police aren't going to come when our livelihoods and our homes are under attack. It means a number of things. It means that everything that we hold dear ultimately is under threat, actually. It means that all our politics, all our democracy, are under threat from such a feral and disengaged section of community. No ones with council, no council at all anywhere. No conservative side of the chamber, no Labour side of the chamber. Nobody to debate the pros and cons of social justice. Nobody to debate whether we're going to assist the socially deprived. It isn't possible if you have that disorder and chaos out there. That's why the police have to come and we have to have the police numbers to ensure that they can. The uh, socially deprived, those need social justice, we owe them a duty, a helping hand. And not just them, the victims of the rioters and the looters need a helping hand from this council. It's in the resolution. You cannot offer that helping hand unless you have a firm hand to deal with those who attack our society. And that firm hand 
has to come from the police. I commend the consensus part of the resolution to you because it does what this council has a duty to do. It calls for a relook at police numbers in London. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Osborne. The matter now before the Council is a consensus motion tabled at the meeting concerning the police numbers proposed by Councillor Osborne and seconded by Councillor Cook. Please indicate by show of hands those for the motion. Yeah. The motion is carried. The matter now before the Council is the amended motion tabled at the meeting concerning police numbers proposed by Councillor Osborne and seconded by Councillor Al Cooper. Please indicate by show of hands those for the amended motion. But those for the amend... Sorry. Oh, they give me the wrong one. Sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. The motion now before the council is that the amendment proposed by Councillor Cook and seconded by Councillor Cousins is tabled at this meeting in relation to the table motions on SNTs and police numbers be approved. Please indicate by show of hands those for the amendment. Amendment. No, it's Councillor Cook. Thirty-eight for the amendment. Those against the amendment? Twelve. Against is twelve. The result of the voting is thirty-eight for and twelve against. There are no abstentions. Motion. Now we're going to the amended motion. The matter now before the council is the amended motion tabled at the meeting concerning police numbers and SNTs proposed by Councillor Osborne and seconded by Councillor L. Cooper. Please indicate by show of hands those for the motion. Is it the same numbers? Read. Thank you. Same numbers. <laughs> 